Hello, everybody, and welcome to another session of the 2022 Stockholm Security Conference organized by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, uh, CIPRI. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Lauria Neo. I'm a research assistant here at CIPRI uh, within the dual use and arms trade controls program, and I'll be moderating this uh, session titled Dual Capable Missiles and Non-Nuclear Missiles with Strategic Effect, Are Current Control Regimes Fit for Purpose? So the existing missile non-proliferation instruments, um, including the Missile Technology Control Regime, the MTCR, uh, and the Hague Code of Conduct Against Ballistic Missile Proliferation, have largely focused on controlling missiles um, because of their association with weapons of mass destruction, uh, WMDs, um, so for their possible use as uh, delivery systems for nuclear, chemical, or biological weapons. Um, and yet there is a growing trend towards using high-precision missiles for conventional missions, including to achieve a strategic effect. So effects that go beyond uh, the tactical and operational levels of warfare. And there are also a number of emerging advanced missile technologies, uh, including hypersonic missiles that are dual capable meaning that they are being developed both for conventional and nuclear missions. While dual capable missile capabilities are not new, current developments might pose new risks and they might reinforce the inherent ambiguity that surrounds uh, those systems. So today's session um, should be an occasion to explore these issues uh, further and to reflect on the impact that these types of delivery systems, uh, so both dual capable missiles and non-nuclear missiles with strategic effect um, have on contemporary conflict. We'll also take the opportunity today um, to reflect on developments that we observe in the context of Russia's war uh, against Ukraine, where we have seen the massive use of missiles um, on military and civilian targets, um, posing the question whether these systems uh, really provide a decisive um, advantage. And in today's session, uh, we'll also discuss the limitations and opportunities um, for strengthening the existing multilateral, plurilateral, and bilateral uh, instruments for missile arms control and non-proliferation. Finally, we aim here to provide a space for rethinking a little bit uh, the approaches to controlling conventional and dual-capable uh, missile and delivery system proliferation. So we have an excellent panel to guide us through these issues today, um, which I would now like to briefly uh, introduce uh, in the order that they're going to, to speak. Um, our first panelist uh, is Fabian Hoffman. Uh, Fabian is a PhD research fellow at the Oslo Nuclear Project. His PhD research um, currently focuses on the proliferation, deployment and use of non-nuclear strategic weapons. Uh, in particular conventional, stri conventional precision strike capabilities and their applications on nuclear strategy and on um, broader nuclear weapons policy. And prior to joining the University of Oslo, Fabian worked as a research assistant at the International Institute for Strategic Studies, uh, IISS, where he helped organize a roundtable on non-nuclear weapons with strategic effect, and where he published uh, several papers on the topic. So thank you, Fabian, for, for joining us. Um, the second panelist uh, joining us today is Dr. Manpreet Siti. Uh, Dr. Siti is a distinguished fellow at the Center for Air Power Studies in New Delhi, and she heads the center's program on nuclear issues. Um, her current focus areas include nuclear security instruments, uh, as well as nuclear governments. And Dr. Sedi is also on the board of directors of the Asia Pacific uh, Leadership Network, so APLN. Uh, she is also the co-chair of Women in Nuclear India and co-chair of a working group on reducing pathways to nuclear use at the Belfast Center uh, at Harvard University. 
And last but not least, um, the third and final panelist today will be my colleague, uh, Claudia Brockman. Claudia works uh, here at CIPRI as a senior researcher within the dual use and, and arms trade controls program. Um, he conducts research in the fields of export controls, uh, non-proliferation and, and technology governance. And he's currently leading a project uh, at CIPRI on the uh, missile technology control regime, the MTCR, examining um, developments in missile technologies uh, as well as the space industry uh, and their impact that they can have on export controls, as well as exploring pathways uh, to strengthening the regime. Before turning to Fabian for the first um, remarks, uh, I would like to make the following very brief um, housekeeping reminders to let you know um, that this session is being recorded uh, and it will be made available online um, shortly after um, its conclusion. Um, also to let you know that the session will be um, kind of structured in three parts, uh, starting with remarks from our three panelists, followed by a moderated panel discussion and then opening um, for questions from the audience. Um, and to submit uh, your question, uh, your questions as participants, uh, feel free to please use the Q&A function here on Zoom. So without further ado, I will now turn to Fabian. Um, Fabian, could you tell us what are non-nuclear missiles with strategic effect? And what are some of the trends and risks associated with the development of these missiles? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Uh, th thank you so much for the invite, Lorian, and, and good afternoon to, to all the participants and um, people watching from all over the world. It's really exciting to be here uh, and to speak to all of you on, on such exciting topics. So I was asked to answer three questions. Um, what are non-nuclear missiles of strategic effect? What are current trends in the development and proliferation of this category of missiles? And also, what are the risks associated with the development of these systems? I will approach these questions also in this order. So let's get started with what, what are non-nuclear missiles of strategic effect? So the term consists essentially of two elements, right? So it's non-nuclear missile and its strategic effect. The first element, non-nuclear missile, seems pretty straightforward. It's simply about missiles that are contrary to nuclear missiles, uh, contrary to nuclear missiles, non-nuclear nature. Um, actually, I, I don't think it's that easy. The term non-nuclear carries certain connotations. It implies a comparability to nuclear weapons because otherwise we could simply refer to them as advanced conventional or conventional strategic weapons, for example. So invoking the term non-nuclear only makes sense if we want to draw an implicit link to nuclear weapons. And I think we can talk about whether this link is desirable, whether it's useful, whether it makes sense um, in the end. But I think in the end, non-nuclear missiles cannot exist without nuclear missiles. So second, the term strategic effect also requires elaboration. Um, during the Cold War, the term strategic has been closely associated with the deployment and use of nuclear weapons, not least because their strategic nature has been enshrined in several legal documents, such as the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks of the 1970s, for example. At the same time, um, also around the 1970s, you saw that the term strategic weapon starting to acquire somewhat of a catch-all functions for military operations and capabilities that go beyond the tactical level of warfare, however exactly they may look like. So, for example, you got Henry Rohn and Albert Wolstetter writing in 1977, um, that have identified seven different meanings at the time of the term relating, for example, to the weapon system used, the context of the use, as well as the targets of these weapon systems. So I think clarification, and that, that was back then, and it's as much necessary today, um, we, need to, we need to clarify what is meant by the term strategic. So in my own research, I use a narrow definition that very much relates to the early usage of the term as initially invoked by air power theorists in the interwar period. So to me, strategic weapons are those that can attack the sources of enemy power directly. In that sense, strategic weapons allow their possessor states to bypass the tactical and operational levels of warfare where individual units meet and maneuver to achieve what scholars have referred to as independent effect. So in other words, producing, producing strategic effect enables the attacking side to achieve victory prior to and without necessarily engaging and defeating 
the majority of the adversary's armed forces in attritional warfare on the battlefield. That begs then, of course, the question as to where we can find the sources of national power. And it's really difficult to write an exhaustive list in that regard, and I will not attempt to do so. However, scholars and analysts, they generally agree that it should include leadership, power supply, in particular in the form of electricity and oil, infrastructure, population and morale, and also the state's fielded forces, including and in particular its nuclear weapons. So to summarize then, to me, the term non-nuclear missile strategic effect it refers to non-nuclear missile capabilities capable of engaging the enemy sources of power directly independent of the warfighting efforts at the tactical and operational levels of warfare. So what are current trends in the development and proliferation of this category of missiles? I think that we see that an increasing number of states, including small and medium-sized powers, are acquiring potential non-nuclear strategic missiles. I say potential on purpose because I don't think or I don't believe that most of these states are acquiring non-nuclear missile capabilities with explicit strategic functions in mind. In fact, I would say that to this state, there's only one state that is deploying an explicit non-nuclear strategic missile capability, and that is South Korea. This being said, officials of several other states by now, including of Japan, Taiwan, uh, and Iran, for example, have recently made statements implying the potential use of non-nuclear weapon systems for strategic counterforce and counter-value purposes, some of which have traditionally been associated with nuclear weapons. In terms of development, I, I would draw attention to two things. Um, first, we currently see a horizontalization in terms of the ability to produce non-nuclear missiles capable of producing strategic effect. So in the past, European and North American suppliers had a clear monopoly over the missile market, Nowadays, the number of potential suppliers of missiles and also of missiles cap potentially capable of producing strategic effect is steadily, steadily increasing with notable entrants in the Middle East and Asia, including Turkey, Iran, and South Korea, for example. Second, the separating line between anti-ship and land attack missiles is increasingly blurry. The integration of satellite navigation into mid-course guidance and the use of advanced terminal seekers allows anti-ship missiles to also engage land-based targets. So for our topic, that, that means that anti-ship missiles may also be employed to target the adversary's national power sources on land and may hence potentially be categorized as non-nuclear strategic weapons. Of course, this anti-ship land attack dual role of modern missiles also introduces potential problems with regard to export control regimes and other non-proliferation instruments, and we may discuss those probably later. Um, then lastly, what are the risks associated with the development of these systems? Uh, the implications of the proliferation, deployment, and use of non-nuclear missiles of strategic effect are complex and multifaceted. And there is a commonly held view in the existing literature that non-nuclear strategic missiles, they constitute a threat to strategic stability, in particular by potentially facilitating a disarming first strike and introducing arms race pressures into conflict diets. In addition, at times it's argued that by providing smaller non-nuclear weapon states with a strategic capability, the power to start a nuclear war may be spreading. Well, I think it's too early to draw comprehensive conclusions about the strategic implications of this weapons category, I would argue that its impact will likely be less disruptive and less destabilizing than many assume. So why is that? First of all, I think it's really important to recognize that non-nuclear strategic weapons are not the 21st century or a version of the poor man's atomic bomb. So conducting a strategic attack is highly demanding, especially without recourse to nuclear weapons. Doing so requires a large conventional arsenal, as well as excellent intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or ISR capabilities, and small and medium-sized powers will likely have access to neither. As such, I would say that not every state in the possession of a potential non-nuclear strategic missile capability will also automatically deploy a credible non-nuclear strategic deterrent. Beyond that, I would also argue that even among the major powers, there's only one state that has both the arsenal size and the necessary ISR enablers to deploy a serious non-nuclear strategic capability, and that is the United States. So as a result, I, I think that in terms of power imbalances, the impact of potential non-nuclear missiles or strategic effect is not as dramatic and as disrupting as it is sometimes portrayed. They are more likely to exacerbate existing dynamics and risks rather than creating new ones. 
Um, with that being said, I'm going to end my remarks and I really look forward to the subsequent discussion and the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Fabian, for this uh, rich overview, uh, for delving back a little bit in, in the concept um, and indeed that requires clarification um, for kind of drawing this explicit link um, to, to, to nuclear weapons um, with the systems. Um, thank you for providing as well a, a clear overview of the trend um, trends in the development and, and proliferation of, of the systems. Um, and I also for highlighting that um, states uh, do not necessarily acquire them um, explicitly for, for strategic effects. I think that's, a, that's an important um, point. Um, and thanks also for touching on the impacts of these systems. And I think that we can also um, delve a little bit more into this in, in the, in the Q&A session. I'll now turn to, the, to our second um, panelist, Dr. Seti, um, to address uh, developments related uh, this time to dual capable missiles. Um, Dr. Seti, could you tell us more about the main trends that are um, related to their development? Uh, currently, and what impact they are having in a regional context as well as in, in the kind of global context. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorian, and thank you, Sipri, for having me as a panelist on this discussion on a subject of extremely high relevance. In fact, traditionally, most of our focus on missiles has been on those capable of delivery of WMD. Uh, but new trends are coming into focus, and I think uh, it's very important that we broaden uh, the discussion, the scope that we have of our discussion on missile types. So you've asked me to comment on two developments uh, in the case uh, of what we are seeing today, uh, dual capable missiles and hypersonic missiles. So I will briefly describe my understanding of these two trends, but I also want to briefly flag three other developments uh, that too I think are worthy of consideration. I want to throw them out uh, for everyone to sort of comment on. So let me start with the concept of dual capable missiles. As we know, these are capable of carrying both a conventional and a nuclear payload. And during the Cold War, superpowers maintained largely a distinction between missiles for delivery of nuclear and non-nuclear ordnance. But this trend, uh, I think, was disrupted somewhere in the early 2000s when the US brought in the concept of conventional global prompt strike. After 9-11, uh, the major threat perception for the US was that of a terrorist strike, the non-state actor. And this led them then to think about how would you neutralize a threat from the non-state actor, which would be time sensitive. And therefore you had to get to the target, which in most cases would likely be a hardened shelter or a deep buried cave. So in order to hit them quickly, the US reached the conclusion that it would use existing ICBMs with conventional warheads. But this option was seen uh, with concern in both Russia and China. They were concerned that such conventionally armed ICBMs could also be used to attack their nuclear forces, and this would undercut their deterrence. So amongst the many steps that they then took uh, to find new tools to enhance their deterrence, one of them was then to move towards development and deployment of dual-use missiles. The idea was to signal ambiguity and thereby deter the possibility of an American attack on with conventional missiles on their nuclear assets uh, by having their own missiles as dual capable. In fact, going a step further, we have since seen that China has not only claimed dual capability role for uh, many of its missiles, but also commingled uh, the conventional and nuclear missiles. So for instance, both nuclear and conventional versions of China's DF-26 are available within the same brigade. They are also under the same command and control of the PLA rocket forces. China finds it useful to follow such a policy uh, to deter the threat from long-range precision strike missiles that can be launched from air and sea platforms by the US. But the Americans call this risk entanglement. Now, whether Beijing understands the risks it is creating or not, it certainly senses that it can better deter the US by signaling to it that it must think twice before using its missiles since it may end up, even if inadvertently, 
targeting sites where nuclear and conventional assets are co-located, or it might hit missiles which are dual capable. So while the US may have planned to hit conventional missiles or conventional capability of China, China may perceive it as an attack on its nuclear missiles. And this then increases the potential for escalation. I find Pakistan follows the same logic to deter India's conventional capability too. So there are uh, countries which believe that creating risks with the idea of ambiguity with dual use missiles is a good idea for the sake of deterrence. The second trend that is visible today is deployment, development and deployment of hypersonic missiles. And we find many countries are moving in this direction. Now, this new technology, as we all know, includes both boost glide vehicles and cruise missiles. Both these travel at speeds faster than Mach 5 through the upper atmosphere. And while existing ICBMs do attain and sustain hypersonic speeds, this is only during the boost and terminal phase. But in the case of a hypersonic delivery system, most of its flight is at high speed and also with high levels of maneuverability. This creates challenges for their interception by missile defense systems. Now, if equipped with suitable guidance systems, these missiles can then be used for precision strikes against high value fixed targets, such as command and control installations, hardened bunkers, and potentially time sensitive mobile targets as well, such as maritime ships. So China is assessed to have the world's largest and most well-funded hypersonic missile research program it's DF-17, the hypersonic light vehicle was unveiled in 2019, believed to have uh, roughly a range of 2000 kilometers and maybe dual capable. So this is again, now you have a linkage with dual capable with hypersonic. While the US has declared a conventional role for its hypersonic systems, Russia claims that they could be dual capable and so does China. It maintains ambiguity and not just in the type of warhead it may carry, but there is also an ambiguity because of the maneuverability, because you don't know which target is that missile going for. So this is the problem that is coming with these two trends. But very quickly, I want to flag three other trends. The first of this is increasing sophistication of cruise missiles, capable of being launched across platforms, land, sea, or air. They are highly advanced today in terms of cruising capability, owing to inbuilt and satellite gu guided navigation systems. They also fly in a terrain-hugging manner, thereby evading radar detection, and modern cruise missiles are therefore proving to be lethal delivery platforms at both subsonic as well as supersonic speeds. Many nuclear weapons possessing countries have declared them as dual capable. And particularly in my region, I find both China and Pakistan have declared their cruise missiles as dual capable. The second trend that I want to talk about is which is proliferating across states is the use of unmanned vehicles or drones for delivery of warheads. So while UAVs have been in use for you know, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, UCAVs or unmanned combat aerial vehicles have also come to vogue, though conceived largely for conventional role. But again, countries like Russia have mentioned them for nuclear delivery as well, including in underwater platforms. So the unmanned underwater vehicle, such as the Poseidon, has been declared as capable of detonating a nuclear weapon close to the coast of the adversary to cause what they call a radioactive tsunami. Unmanned systems then, with increasing use of artificial intelligence, will bring in a new dimension to delivery of warheads. And I think this is another trend that I wanted to put out. The last trend that I want to mention is deployment of MERVED and MARVED missiles multiple independently retargetable vehicles, as well as maneuverable uh, re-entry vehicles. So in one case, one missile is capable of carrying many warheads, and the other case, there are maneuverable re-entry warheads. The justification for these is often made to defeat the adversary's missile defenses. But traditional thinking about these systems has been that these are essentially first strike weapons, and therefore they can tempt countries towards preemption. Since one missile is carrying a large fraction of your nuclear arsenal, you would rather have them off your soil uh, you know, before they get attacked here. So the chances of crisis instability then go up because you are tempted towards preemption. But it also poses the problem of arms control uh, stability or instability because of the problem of offense and defense spiral. 
countries are likely to be pulled into an arms race, thereby leading to creation of more security dilemmas. So really the trends which are related to missiles today are several and they're posing new challenges to us. I hope by the end of this session, we would have looked at some of the ways of addressing these challenges. Thank you, Lorian. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Seti. You brought uh, forward, I think, some very interesting points about um, ongoing trends. Uh, I, uh, I take uh, your point about uh, the inherent ambiguity, but especially the fact that this uh, ambiguity signaling is, uh, is kind of uh, wanted by design uh, by states that, that uh, uh, develop these um, dual, uh, dual capable missiles. Um, also take um, uh, very much your points about the development of hypersonic missiles and uh, the kind of um, risks that they pose and the increased ambiguity, uh, not only in terms of the warhead, but also on the targets given the um, increased maneuver maneuverability. Um, and, um, and thanks very much for highlighting uh, additional um, uh, trends, whether it relates to, to cruise missile uh, developments, uh, to the UAVs, uh, which uh, I think we could also come back in the in the Q&A, and to, to MIRV and, and, and MARV's um, warheads. Um, so thanks very much for, for, such, a, for such comprehensive remarks. Um, and thank you both, uh, Fabian and Dr. Seti, for already pointing a little bit towards um, uh, arms controls and, and kind of export controls um, uh, that, that we can start uh, looking at. Um, and I'll turn to, to our third panelist, uh, Kolia, uh, for this. Um, Kolia, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, how the uh, relevant uh, instruments existing today uh, covering these types of missiles um, uh, address uh, address these issues and, and what are their their approaches? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lorian, and thanks so much to to Fabian and, and Manfred already for for really insightful remarks. So, as to your questions, I think first it's important to note again that in the case of missiles and other delivery systems, there is no international prohibition or non-proliferation treaty that establishes a clear norm against their development, production, possession, or use. So that sets it apart from the frameworks and norms we have for nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons. And at the same time, you know, that also explains why many of the existing instruments focus on missiles as delivery systems for nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. And important to mention here as well that, uh, at least for some of them, missiles then also includes or is uh, mentioned in the same breath with other uncrewed aerial vehicles, uh, UAVs of different kinds. I'll, I'll get a bit more into that later, but maybe first, um, missile arms control has been in decline for a while. Uh, with the withdrawals from the INF Treaty, uh, being the last and perhaps most prominent example of a specific bilateral missile arms control instrument being disbanded. Um, there are some remaining limitations on missiles as strategic delivery systems under the new START treaty. Um, so that does, for example, mean that uh, Russia's avant-garde hypersonic boost glide system is counted under new START and is subject to the uh, treaty limitations and uh, some of the verification measures. But it is quite limited what we have in terms of uh, traditional arms control instruments um, that, that we still have left. I would like to focus a few minutes on three multilateral instruments in particular that constitute what we usually refer to as multilateral export control regimes and as uh, transparency and confidence building measures. The missile technology control regime, um, the VASNA arrangement on conventional arms and dual use goods and technologies, and the hate code of conduct against ballistic missile proliferation. So let me start with the missile technology control regime or MTCR. Uh, the MTCR is an informal arrangement between a, a group of uh, some 35 missile technology supplier states that basically get together and coordinate, harmonize how they approach missile export controls to help prevent the proliferation of 
missiles and other uncrewed delivery systems capable of carrying nuclear, chemical and biological weapons. So here again, we see that connection. Um, the MTCR partners, that's what they call their members, uh, have agreed on guidelines that any exports of missiles with a capacity to carry a payload of at least uh, 500 kilogram to a range of at least 300 kilometers, uh, so-called category one systems, are subject to what they call a strong presumption of denial. That means the MTCR partners should not actually export missiles and UAVs with those capabilities and any complete production facilities for them. Um, there is an exception under the most exceptional circumstances, uh, which has to then be, be argued for and clarified. Um, but in general, it, it should mean that this system should not be exported. In addition, the partners have also created a control list of sensitive missile related dual use items. Uh, so that covers a whole range of uh, technologies, um, subsystems, production equipment, and so on that is related to missile, but also sort of like the um, civilian counterparts to space launch vehicle technology. And this is really quite an important um, addition because the control list and, and the guidelines are the basis of export controls, both of the MTCR partners, but also for many states outside of this regime. Uh, it's notable also that it is the basis uh, that is often used for sanctions in missile contexts. So for example, the UN sanctions regimes against the uh, DPRK and North Korea and Iran both use forms of the, the MTCR control. This is the basis for what is, uh, you know, what limitations apply as part of these sanctions regimes. And we're now seeing it uh, in the context of the sanctions issued against Russia by many states as well, uh, because uh, both the American sanctions and the uh, European sanctions use versions of control lists that uh, include these as well. Um, I want to uh, mention the, uh, the Vasna arrangement. I think it's, it's quite important and it's often uh, forgotten in this context, while it's not missile focused like the MTCR, uh, the Vasna arrangement actually covers, sort of applies the widest definition of missiles. Um, and so in that case, export controls that states apply under uh, under the Vasna arrangement uh, or those who adopt the rules of uh, of Vasna. Also, that means that most exports of missiles are you know fall under export controls. Notably, the Vasna arrangement is not as restrictive as the MTCR when it comes to to missiles. So there's no specific presumption of uh, denial. And the aim of the Vasna arrangement also differs because it speaks about um, trying to prevent what they call destabilizing accumulations of conventional arms, which is a very broad, um, you know, a broad approach. And in general, it has resulted in, in a less restrictive approach. But in general, we can consider all missiles covered and those states uh, which are part of the MTCR use this specific uh, notion and, um, and a definition with the um, payload and range threshold, uh, but all states also still need to make a proper assessment on when it, they actually would want to export uh, systems. The last instrument I, I want to highlight now is uh, the Hague Code of Conduct. Um, so the Hague Code of Conduct against ballistic missile proliferation. Good to say the, the full name again, because this instrument only focuses on uh, ballistic missiles. Um, it is a transparency and confidence building measure. Uh, so it uh, provides a range of measures that uh, the subscribing states have to um, have to submit every year and have to submit on certain occasions. That includes uh, pre-launch notifications on, on uh, any uh, missile tests and um, declarations of their policies that relate to missiles and to space launch vehicles, uh, as well as some, um, you know, some in, uh, information exchange that happens um, through that forum uh, as well. So if we take these three instruments and look at the sort of two, or particularly the two concepts of 
dual capable and strategic effect that have been introduced by the previous two speakers, we actually have to realize that both instruments do not use those terms. They do not refer to either strategic effect of missiles or any dual capable nature. Um, the Hague Code of Conduct speaks simply of ballistic missiles. Uh, so the nature of uh, ballistic missiles has, of course, also evolved and improved. And you know we have improvements in mid-course and terminal guidance. Um, we are we're seeing uh, quite a lot of adaptations uh, that you have in terms of maneuverability uh, in in those or in the warheads as well. So it's not as clear cut anymore, but still. Uh, the Hague Code of Conduct is limited to that. And there have been a couple of, um, you know, uh, tries to to also include cruise missiles, for example. And you mentioned you know, cruise missiles um, are really an important trend uh, where we're actually seeing um, proliferation at the uh, horizontal level. So more states which are cry acquiring those capabilities. And I think it also goes a bit towards some what Fabian has said in terms of the uses and the uh, strategic um, uses that are being applied to some systems as well. So in that sense, you know, in terms of the, the scope, the uh, Hitchcock is already um, somewhat limited. It's also become more difficult to deal with the uh, definition, just looking at, for example, hypersonic missiles. Well, do we count those as ballistic missiles of sorts? They usually, or at least the boost glide systems often use a ballistic missile booster and it's rather the um, the warhead or um, the, uh, de uh, the re-entry vehicle that gives the specific um, characteristic to that missile. You know, we also have maneuverable re-entry vehicles on, on other ballistic missiles. And you know, there, it isn't really a question, it's just, the extent to which it changes the capability is much more significant, um, some would say, for, for some of these uh, hypersonic boost glide systems. Um, so there, we, we don't actually have agreement in the code of conduct whether it falls under it. And uh, so it's a matter of interpretation and, and still ongoing discussion in that instrument. If we look at the MTCR, um, I'm always a bit torn. On the one hand, you can say it's quite an elegant solution. On the other hand, it has many shortcomings because uh, the MTCR refers to missiles and other uncrewed aerial vehicles capable of delivering weapons of mass destruction. So here we are looking again at the context that is drawing, of course, on more sort of like normative power than because it's part of, um, you know, fulfilling uh, the, the obligations under those uh, regimes, under uh, the treaties. But on the other hand, seeing that um, missiles have become much more versatile, and we are now talking about non-nuclear strategic effect context, we are talking about dual capable as something that is done by design to, cre uh, to create a, a certain um, you know, uncertainty or um, you know, leeway in, in terms of how it's seen, but also sort of like playing around with the instability that it might uh, cause. That, of course, is then becoming more difficult in, in the context of the MTCR. Why could one consider it to be elegant? Well, through the threshold that we have, we don't really actually care because as soon as that threshold is surpassed, that is what the MTCR considers as, um, you know, as, as capable. And whether it is you, like whether that capability is surpassed by a conventional uh, a conventionally armed missile or by a dual capable missile or one where we're not sure in terms of like how we how the MTCR applies export controls it is it is still covered um, also uh, systems that are uh, with a range of 300 kilometers and where there um, is reason to believe that it is for a chemical nuclear biological end use are treated uh, in, in the same restrictive way. So it has advantages and disadvantages. It's very much rooted in where, where we come from, but it's also something that I think we need to reconsider. And I hope we will get to that in, in, in the Q&A um, after, after this. Maybe the last point also to mention, there are a lot of shortcomings and a lot of um, problems that we have with these instruments. They, first of all, 
expo controls they have limited aims you know they can slow down and make it more uh, expensive to acquire weapons but as fabian says we are seeing certain trends particularly in the area of um, cruise missiles uh, where there is horizontal proliferation to more and more states i think in terms of the possessors of, of ballistic missiles we've actually seen uh, some reductions at times and it's been relatively stable but at the same time the regimes are tend to be quite slow they uh, only work on consensus particularly in the current context that's extremely difficult and we're seeing these you know what some would say are new systems or at least uh, you know new new types of systems like many of the hypersonics like uh, some of the uh, the other uh, precision strike uh, systems and we need to ensure that the coverage is there. So also the technical work in those regimes needs to continue and needs to actually come to uh, conclusions. Um, there's no enforcement mechanisms and, and each of those are in a way um, systems that are uh, largely voluntary and, and have no enforcement behind them. So they are to some extent weak systems. They have been strong in creating some norms and uh, in creating effects that also went beyond the, their immediate membership. The High Court of Conduct has become uh, very large. I think it's 143 states currently that subscribe to it. So we are seeing still an effect and norm building through what we have is important. But I think it also sorely points to the lack of um, arms control instruments that we have uh, in this space and uh, the issues that um, that we still need to address and the limitations of the instruments and i'll leave it at that so we can uh, move in uh, to to a discussion with everyone i'm really looking forward to that thank you thank you thank you very much uh, colia for taking a look at um, existing instruments that cover uh, missile systems so the MTCR, the Hague Code of Conduct, but thank you also for mentioning the, the Vassana arrangement, which is, uh, as you mentioned, not, not often raised. Um, and how these instruments um, in part, but not uh, all fully cover uh, the types of missiles that, that we're looking at today um, and, uh, and the types of uh, challenges that they pose. Um, so thanks for stressing the, the limitations of, of these instruments. Um, and I hope that the uh, second part of the session uh, that we'll move into uh, now can provide us uh, with an opportunity to think about um, perhaps how to strengthen uh, these instruments um, and to rethink their approach um, to controlling um, conventional and, and dual capable uh, missile proliferation. Um, so I think we'll now move to the to the panel discussion and um, Here's a quick reminder to, to submit any questions that you'd like to ask uh, the panelists uh, through the Q&A function um, on Zoom. Um, but I think I will, um, I will start with some questions of my own. And um, the first question I would like to ask um, goes back to the concept of uh, non-nuclear uh, strategic uh, weapons. Uh, so the the concept is is broader than just uh, missiles, uh, um, and it, and it considers uh, other uh, types of weapons uh, in the in the space domain, some some cyber capabilities as well. So, how relevant uh, is perhaps this concept um, uh, in the missile context? Um, and if I can already ask a, a second question, um, does the war in Ukraine? Uh, bringing in the, the Ukraine conflict um, demonstrate some of the limitations of advanced conventional missiles, um, given that to date, uh, it appears that uh, Russia's uh, a quite massive use of missiles has not uh, given a, a decisive advantage in, in the war. Um, and I would turn to, to Fabian uh, first for this, but uh, would very much then welcome uh, both uh, Dr. Sedi and, and Cordia to jump in as well. Thanks very much. Yeah, th thanks for the great question. And um, yeah, turning to the first sub question, so how relevant is that concept uh, of non-nuclear weapons of strategic effect in missile context? Um, as you said, you know, right in the beginning, I'm, I'm writing my uh, PhD thesis on 
uh, non-nuclear weapons, uh, non-nuclear strategic weapons, in particular long-range precision strike capabilities. So I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot here and say it's not relevant. Um, that I, I would definitely say it's, it's very relevant. And compared to these other potentially non-nuclear strategic weapon systems that you mentioned, especially cyber, I think it's most relevant in the missile context. Um, why is that? I think if you, if you look at cyber, at least for me, um, it is very much, it's a concerning prospect, right? To have strategic cyber weapons. But I think the empirical evidence that we have right now hints that this is still a more notional issue. Um, it's still more theoretical. I'm not gonna say we're not gonna get there in a couple of years or decades, but I think right now, at least what the empirical evidence is telling me um, is that, that we're not yet there. And then if you look at missiles, we actually see that in the 1990, 1990s already, um, especially in the context of Operation Desert Storm, but also in the subsequent military interventions by the United States and its allies, you've seen the strategic potential of conventional missiles. So here we're not in the theoretical, it's, it's a proven capability. Um, and we only have to consider, you know, like to, to what extent does it really disrupt established uh, knowledge in the field? Um, so I think it's most relevant in the missile context. So what does the what's the what's the implications of non-nuclear strategic weapons in the Ukraine Ukrainian context? Um, or more broadly of conventional missiles. I think the number one lesson is that if you are engaged or if you feel like you might be engaged in a in a major war in the coming years and decades, you don't want to fight this war without missiles. I think on both sides, we have seen how absolutely crucial these capabilities are for conventional war fighting in the 21st century. So I think really what we're going to see now is an increased pressure to acquire these capabilities. Um, and I would say that, that that's for most countries. That's as much in the NATO context um, as also far beyond that in, in different regions of the world. What I think is really interesting um, with regard to the concept of non-nuclear strategic weapons if you look at Russian doctrine prior to the Ukrainian war, actually they foresaw somewhat uh, of a non-nuclear strategic strike, in particular a non-nuclear a non-nuclear strategic counter-value strike. It, they, they attached these functions to their conventional weapons. Um, so the idea was, or what we what you read, could read in Russian doctrine was that a specific function of the precision strike arsenal was to take out critical civilian infrastructure essentially right in the beginning of the war to, to signal dominance, uh, to undermine the war fighting capability, but then also to undermine the long-term vitality of the adversary's economy. And, and we didn't see that in Ukraine. I think that's mostly because Russia initially thought, you know, within days or weeks, we're gonna have won this war and then we're gonna take over Ukraine. So why should we then destroy the infrastructure? We're the ones responsible for rebuilding it. So I think that's why we didn't see it actually happening um, in, in, in the first couple of days and weeks of the war, um, where actually Russia's use of missiles was relatively restrained. It could have been much more. I mean, now the gloves are much more off. I think now they want to actually move in the direction of employing these missiles of more strategic effect. But I would say now the arsenals are too depleted. Uh, the air defense um, is too sophisticated on the Ukrainian side. It's, get, it's going to get better every week. So, so I think the, the time window for that is closed. And then the last point, I think what we also see is actually that, that Russian missiles, they were not as sophisticated as we had assumed, both in terms of accuracy and also in terms of survivability. So the rate at which these weapon systems are shot down right now by Western air defense system in Ukraine, um, I didn't expect that. And, and I would have assumed that these cruise missiles are more survivable, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Dr. Sedi, would you like to, to also comment on this? Yes, and I agree with a lot of what uh, Fabian has said about uh, you know, non-nuclear missiles. I do believe have a strategic effect. Uh, that's a reality. And that's largely coming from the fact that uh, today's missiles are far more accurate uh, than they used to be in the past. And really missile technology is 80 years old today. Uh, but modern missiles have registered advances in range, in navigation, in use of advanced materials and endurance. 
So earlier when accuracy was not easy to achieve, the missiles were seen to have a strategic effect only when they were carrying the nuclear warhead. But with the CEP now, uh, you know, being what it is, uh, with better satellite and internal guidance systems, precision targeting with cruise conventional missiles uh, is possible and it does have a strategic effect. I also agree with Fabian that uh, I think in the Russia-Ukraine conflict, we have seen large-scale use of conventional missiles by both sides uh, to achieve strategic gains. The sinking of Moscow was one such event uh, when the Ukrainian anti-ship cruise missile Neptune caused a strategic effect. Similarly, Russia too has used a large number of its short-range ballistic missiles, including its uh, intermediate you know, hypersonic Kinzhal, uh, which is believed to have been used to hit some strategic targets, such as ammunition storage sites and bridges. Now, while uh, you know, we tend to believe that uh, strategic effect has not been ach achieved because uh, a, you know, there's been no declaration of victory or defeat, uh, but modern conflicts uh, uh, involve a lot of factors that come into play. So while uh, you know, I, I, uh, Russia did a slow sl start uh, to its action, believing that not much would be needed to bring Ukraine down to its knees, uh, but given the fact that Ukraine uh, got support from US NATO and has continued to hold up uh, you know, its part of uh, the front, uh, we are seeing more and more engagement of the conventional missiles. And as Fabian said, uh, many countries are watching this. They're going to derive lessons from here, including on how to use those conventional missiles far more effectively. Now, my concern here is that while Russia used the Kinzhal, which is a hypersonic missile in conventional mode, in the case of Ukraine, it has been declared as a dual capable missile. Uh, so when a conflict like this happens between two nuclear power states, right now what we are seeing is between one nuclear and the other is a non-nuclear state. But what would be the impact of such missiles when it happens between two nuclear armed states where the missile has been declared as dual capable? So when the delivery uh, system is declared as dual capable, it combines, as I said earlier, target ambiguity as well. Then what would happen? Would countries then have a tendency to lower their alert levels towards launch on warning? So the moment you see a missile coming at you, you're going to assume the worst about the adversary and go nuclear. So are we then going to slip even with use of conventional missiles, uh, you know, which have been declared as dual capable, would we then be sliding uh, closer to stumbling towards a nuclear war? And that is where I find the concern coming in. So the strategic effect right now with conventional missiles is certainly possible, but the dangers grow when two nuclear armed states uh, get into this domain. And that's what I wanted to bring out about this. Thank you very much. Kolia, um, would you also like to, to step in on this? Maybe just very briefly, um, and I think um, and I'll leave it to my to my two colleagues here to to go into the details on uh, the doctrinal um, questions that are associated with this. But I'm I think I very much agree on some of the observations in terms of we have to see the specific context of the Ukrainian war um, and Russia's approach to it in terms of how it has affected the use of systems and the missions that are associated with this. And to be honest, for me, this brings me sort of like to the associated question of, well, Fabian says he wouldn't be surprised to see more pressure uh, towards more states trying to acquire certain capabilities uh, because they would like to acquire a, a modern warfighting capability that has to rely on those systems. Um, at the same time, in the way that uh, many of the instruments, as I mentioned, are designed, it's still based on um, the capability to, to carry uh, nuclear weapons or the association with, with nuclear weapons. So how are we going to manage these pressures in the future? Uh, because the demand might be there. Um, can the instruments that we have still deal with this? And it's also going to be something that the main supplier states will have to deal with in terms of how they reflect on it and how other supplier states, which are not part of uh, the existing arch architecture deal with it. Because right now we're seeing a trend to more and more um, 
more and more military equipment that previously states had been quite restrictive on uh, it's sort of in the Western Alliance being, um, you know, they're more willing to, to now uh, supply that. I mean, in the Ukraine context, I think it's very specific, and we should also kind of leave that to the side a bit. But it's also a trend that we'll have to see in the future. On the other side, we're seeing that Russia is now actually using both Iran and North Korea as suppliers of um, conventionally armed uh, missiles of drones. And so we're seeing certain trends in terms of where uh, the proliferation is, is and supply is moving of, of systems both horizontally and um, and vertically. So I think that aspect to it is also quite important to, uh, to keep in mind um, and um, the destabilizing effects that we then see of the systems uh, is, is something that uh, is on top of that as well. Thank you. Thanks um, very much to the, to the three of you. And um, I think given the, the increased engagement of these uh, missiles that we see um, right now and the high demand perhaps for, for some of these systems or at least a very high interest by a number of states, um, I'd like to turn a little bit to the um, arms control and, and non-proliferation side and, and asking the three of you, um, yeah, to what extent the remaining instruments uh, are adequate or not uh, in addressing the risks and how they could perhaps be, be strengthened in a way. Um, so we've spoken about the MTCR, um, the Hague Code of Conduct, um, perhaps uh, the Vassana arrangement to an extent, uh, but perhaps also other instruments. Um, and looking a little bit beyond that, are there possibilities um, for creating uh, dedicated um, kind of new instruments that could that could address this. Um, so I would turn um, this question to to the three of you, perhaps this time starting starting with Kolya though. Yeah, thank you, Lorian. And I mean, I think we've we've sort of now looked at this in a specific um, context of a scenario that unfortunately we see, you know, living out every every day at the moment. Um, and if we if we draw the the scale uh, a bit here and look at it more more broadly, I mean, as I mentioned, a lot of these these instruments have limitations, and the the current context, uh, if uh, you know, of the context between Russia and um, many Western allies through the UK, uh, Ukraine war, is is one part. But we also see other trends in in this area that have made uh, a lot of these um, um, a lot of these efforts quite difficult. Uh, the great power com competition, as some would refer to it, or the geopolitical uh, conflict, particularly between uh, the United States and China, and how that has involved uh, different uh, different partners on each side, but also in general how that has played out. Uh, even for developing countries who are affected by the type of uh, measures that we put in place on export controls, for example, but also the, the regional dimensions of, of many of the issues uh, that we see and that uh, each of the uh, nuclear powers, for example, uh, have, to, have to deal with. And um, in those contexts, seeing that the arms control architecture is, is crumbling, I think the INF treaty was a, was a was a big loss. Um, it was at least encouraging that that led to talking more about INF for different regions or INF globally. But unfortunately, that I think it it just looks very bleak in terms of the prospects of actually getting somewhere uh, with those. I think on the instruments that we have, they all have a lot of value, and I think particularly when we look at the MTCR and the Code of Conduct states should make a, a dedicated effort to, to get to incremental improvements. It's incredibly difficult in the MTCR because you know we are basically seeing a war between two members. Both Ukraine and Russia uh, are part of the MTCR. So finding consensus decisions is, is very difficult right now. At the same time, it is still incredibly important to have that instrument because it's, I think, basically the only 
instrument that provides a forum for technical experts from these different countries to get together and actually discuss what the parameters and definitions are that we look at for the types of missile systems that we are concerned about, where we talk about new systems that are coming in, are they covered by export control, but also more general discussion uh, about these systems. And that's quite a unique thing that I think should be protected. And there's there's a lot of incremental ways in which I think the MTCR can be strengthened, perhaps where it can be strengthened more as a, a norm beyond its members as well, because in doing it that way, we can try to at least contribute to norm building at a, at a larger scale. The HCOC, um, it is very limited in scope. That is perhaps the biggest thing that, that needs to improve. It's great that universalization has been continuing at a, at a very good pace over the years, but um, the, the issue of scope is a significant one. And I think there's ways of also strengthening the transparency and confidence building measures that it uh, that it includes. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I'm very, really curious to hear also what, what my fellow panelists uh, have in terms of uh, ideas or views on those. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Kolya. And I can see uh, a couple of questions on the chat also um, touching on, on this issue of how hard it is to, to currently think and kind of devise um, how uh, yeah, renewed impetus for, for new control regimes uh, could come from, um, how to, to kind of think ahead with this. Uh, so maybe uh, Dr. Seti, if you, if you wanna take it on and then Fabian. So <laughs> it's far more easier to uh, identify the challenges that we see. Uh, in terms of the existing regimes than to be able to come up with some constructive solutions at this moment in time. I think uh, Kolya has very nicely brought out what are the strengths and the limitations of these regimes. And I do find that they are grossly insufficient, not only in terms of being limited in how they ensure compliance with the controls that are applied, uh, but even more so in terms of some of the new technological realities uh, that they don't even address. So we do have to find some newness uh, brought into these existing regimes. But the problem, I think, lies in the fact that none of the member states has shown any sense of ownership uh, to come forth with ideas on how do you amend the regimes to address some of their limitations. Or rather, you know, what we find, and as Kolya said, I mean, the interstate tensions and the trust deficits currently are so high uh, that countries are caught in building their own missile capabilities. They're not interested in arresting the trends. Rather, the tendency seems to be towards hedging. Uh, you know, let's not try to bring controls of any kind because you don't know what this technology might lead us to. So even on hypersonics, while we understand what it will mean in terms of, and many people have also commented on the fact that uh, finding a, a proper utility for a hypersonic missile, a military utility, uh, beyond what already exists with the kind of conventional missile capabilities that we have, uh, perhaps is going to be very difficult. And yet countries want to continue going down that path, not try to arrest this trend in any way, because arguments are made to say, but this will lead us towards space planes and you know, it'll, it'll uh, have a lot of peaceful uses in the future. So therefore, let's not try to control any of this. Also, I find in today's times, I mean, proliferation of missiles uh, for a fair bit of time has been a reality, despite NTCR and EDGECOC, We've seen there are countries which are outside these regimes, uh, both suppliers and recipients, and they have carried on, uh, you know, with, with a lot of proliferation activity. I find that in my region particularly rampant. Uh, but besides this, I mean, given the fact that we are seeing the conflict of the kind that Russia has imposed on Ukraine, uh, something that people had sort of given up on, that there will not be such a uh, violation of territorial integrity of another country, that you will not see conventional wars which are territorial of this nature. And yet we are seeing that it's happening. I'm sure many countries are reaching the conclusion that missiles for deterrent purposes is going to be necessary. And therefore they will move towards that. So non-proliferation or arms control regimes, I think are going to be extremely difficult in today's times, at least in the short term. We've seen historically when major powers uh, have a, a joint or a common interest in arriving at some controls, then we get somewhere. 
uh, but at this moment in time, there is no shared sense of risk amongst the big powers. Rather, we are seeing the collapse of uh, great power consensus on non-proliferation. So this competitive relationship phase that we seem to have gotten into, I think is going to make arms control, um, non-proliferation measures of the kind that we saw in the past in terms of treaties extremely difficult. Can we get to some confidence building measures? Now, again, they have been spoken about more at the regional level, but what I find difficult, even at the regional level, particularly in Southern Asia, uh, you know, India, China, Pakistan, is that it, it, uh, there is a strategic chain here. So what happens in the US impacts China, impacts India and impacts Pakistan. So it's very difficult to do something at the regional level unless we can bring in the US. And if the US has to come in, it would want Russia to be brought in because China will not agree to anything that has to do only with uh, India and Pakistan. So it does go up to the multilateral or the global level very quickly. So it's not just about being able to solve this problem at the regional level. However, I want to end with the uh, one suggestion, which I don't know whether it can be possible or not, but it's certainly an idea uh, whose time might come if the sense of risks grows. And this is to give the Indian example of having maintained a separation of nuclear and non-nuclear delivery systems. Uh, so the cruise missiles are only for conventional delivery and ballistic missiles are the only missiles for nuclear delivery. Having this kind of a separation, like it used to be during the Cold War, I think makes sense because you're reducing the risks, uh, especially as you go into uh, uh, you know, newer uh, advances, advancements in missile technologies. So um, can we get rid of the dual use missile systems? Uh, if that can be done, that would be one positive measure, I think, one confidence building measures that countries would have towards each other. How will we get there? I'll leave it to my panelists to say whether it's possible at all or not. Thank you, Lorian. Thank you, Fabian, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I don't think I'm even gonna try to, you know, talk on the MTCR or HCOG. I think the, my other two fellow panelists are um, much better place to, to talk on that. Ma maybe I can highlight a dimension that has not yet been approach and that is the extent to which these arms control non-proliferation or confidence building measures um, are even desirable i mean you know from from my standpoint researching non-nuclear strategic weapons i really appreciate the the strategic stability concerns um that are out there and i i totally get that they exist the the issue though is and that's what i've uh, approached in the beginning of my talk most states are not deploying these weapon systems with strategic functions in mind. And that, that counts, especially um, you know, from a NATO perspective. A NATO is not deploying these conventional precision strike capabilities to threaten uh, China's or, or Russia's nuclear arsenal. Um, in fact, I would argue that NATO has, a, has a definitely a need, and that's been highlighted by the brain war for deep strike capability, which would enable the alliance to target, um, you know, a state's uh, adversaries' rear, such as logistical nodes, tactical command posts, staging posts for troops, and that codes for a whole whole bunch of other countries as well. So, I think right now it's going to be extremely difficult to convince states of participating in such agreements simply because it may not be in their strategic interests. And you know, from, from national perspectives, again, I don't think that these countries are going to be interested in promoting arms control for the sake of arms control. I think right now, as the international climate is, um, I don't think you can convince a lot of states that they have more to gain by participating in these agreements rather than staying out of them. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's very pessimistic, but I think that's simply uh, where, where we are right now. Kolya, over to you. Yeah, maybe just if I can do a quick, a quick follow up on on two aspects. Um, I think what uh, what Manfred has said about uh, confidence building measures is an important point to to consider. And also, when I look at some of the questions that are coming in to the chat in terms of like, like 
is this moment something in which we can try to see uh, if it creates an impetus for for new thinking on on some of the issues. Um, I think one thing that is like you know something to consider is that like at least between the uh, U.S. And, and and Russia, there's a lot of experience in the type of um, transparency and confidence building measures uh, that often have verification elements. Um, and that is something which to some extent has has stopped in this uh, content now, but uh, context now, but I think will be something that both sides will probably direly desire again afterwards as well. Um, whatever afterwards might mean at this point. Um, but it is it is something that I think is very important. And I think of looking at this as, I think we have, to be honest, I think we have little chance to get to the model of clearly dividing uh, delivery systems by category again, in terms of which are nuclear armed and, and, and which aren't. But I think the idea is something that can perhaps be applied across a bit in the sense of if we focus future confidence building measures on dual capable and nuclear armed systems while moving um, our efforts in terms of arms control that has more the traditional arms control verification um, uh, approach and, and maybe some limitations to what we're seeing on, on the conventional end of that spectrum, that might be a way that where states could be more willing. Because I, to be honest, right now, I see very little chance of reductions in the sort of high end new systems that people are, uh, that states seem to desire. While, you know, we, we might see reductions on, on older systems. So, I think we we might need to play uh, need to play around a bit in terms of perhaps by category what type of um, arms control instruments we we could apply. Thanks very much. Thanks to the the three of you. I think we're fast approaching the the end of this session, and so uh, I think we'll we'll have to to stop here. But um, thanks uh, very much. I think uh, as as Dr. Seti said, it is. Um, at this point, probably easier to think of the challenges than the solutions, um, and uh, and perhaps not in some cases uh, desirable uh, for states to to think about some of the uh, uh, control building measures or, or measures that could uh, um, be taken to to reduce um, existing risks. Um, and nevertheless, um, I think it's uh, always useful to try and to try and think ahead to try and. Uh, also, as Kolya mentioned, um, remind us that uh, efforts within existing instruments uh, remain important and, and can be carried forward. Um, and so thanks uh, very much to, to the three of you for joining us today for the very fruitful uh, discussion. Um, and thanks to all participants for, for joining us today and, and for engaging with us. Um, the next session, which will be on attacks on civilian infrastructure, uh, how to ensure the safety and security of nuclear power plants in an armed conflict. Um, we'll start in half an hour, so that's at 4.30 uh, p.m. Um, and so please do join that session as well, uh, which is being convened by my uh, CIPRI colleague, uh, Vitaly Fitchenko. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>